Hello and welcome to our new series on Peter Lynch. Today's episode is part one with general advice. As always, if you're interested in seeing the stocks that I'm currently buying and selling, consider joining with the link down in the description below. And make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell if you enjoyed these kinds of videos. Here's the organization table going over everything being included in this video and where to find it. We'll begin with the most important, which is talking about these professional investors and the disadvantages of Wall Street, which Peter Lynch likes to call street leg. Number one of the disadvantages is stocks are attractive only when others buy, and we'll get into why soon. Number two is their reputation is on the line. Number three, the rules and regulations stopping them. Number four, size disadvantages. Number five, when they actually have access to money. And number six, time wasted explaining themselves. Waiting to buy this stock, like every other stock I try to buy. The first of which is stocks attractive only when others buy. Lots of places have large recommended or suggested lists, according to Peter Lynch. However, it's a game of chicken until a big name place starts buying it first. Then it's confirmed as a good choice because others are buying it. Hey, that stock you've talked about is being bought by this big mutual fund. Oh nice, now it's recognized as a good choice. I was wondering if I should buy it, but decided to wait and see others buy it first. Because of this, you have an edge over them. As a retail investor, or dumb money, you can be contrarian. Who cares what other people have bought, you are the one making the shots. Our analysts say this stock is terrible. Your analysts are stupid. This stock is amazing. I'm loading up now. Number two of the disadvantages is reputation on the line. These people's jobs are on the line with their reputation on what they say. So it leads to stay with the pack mentality. And the benefits will give an example where A, they'll go away from the crowd, or B, they stick with the crowd. So A, they go away from the crowd. If they are right, they get a bonus, congratulations, and water cooler talk about how great they are. And if they're wrong, people are questioning them, it leads to insecurity, Possible job loss depending on how bad the loss and management's choice. So if they're right, it's all great, but if they're wrong, they'll be packing up their belongings. Then we'll get into scenario two, where they stay with the crowd. If they are right, it's nothing special, but the job is easier. And if they are wrong, they can say, guess IBM is having a bad year. Sure, it's bad, but if everyone is wrong, it's not like everyone gets fired or everybody's getting questioned. So if they're right, it's just them doing their job like normal. And if they're wrong, it's just them doing their job like normal. And thus, this leads to your edge because you don't have a reputation on the line. Because as a member of dumb money, your reputation is really low. And trust me, it's a good thing. You don't have to risk your job by picking less known companies. But you might need to reason with your spouse or friends if you even decide to tell them. So I bought some shares of this small company. I think it's going to be big. The company has dipped a lot recently, but I think it will turn around. Haha, <laughs> you're crazy, James. Get back to work before the boss sees you slacking. Third point is the rules and regulations. Down here on the SEC website, there's the Investment Company Act of 1940, and I clicked this to read it. There's 114 pages, a lot of it's repetitive. But I just went over and tried to find what Peter Lynch talked about in the book for the limitations of the fund managers. And there's a lot more controls being put in place for these guys than there are for you. But what's the one part that Peter wants to point out the most? It's this little section. And more importantly in this little section, it's this little part down here at the bottom. To an amount not greater in value than 5% of the value of the total assets of such management company and not to more than 10% of the outstanding voting securities of such issuer. Not greater in value than 5% of the value of the total assets. This is saying the maximum exposure to one security is 5% in their portfolio, if they choose to go that high. The rule is in place to help lower risk through forced diversification of assets. We want this to be 15% of our investment holdings. And the SEC just kind of looks at them and says, nope. Another part, the not more than 10% of the outstanding voting securities of such issuer. 
they can only hold max 10% of the outstanding shares for voting rights. This is to prevent fund managers from gaining controlling portions of companies and ruining things for everyone. We want 51% of this company for controlling voting rights. The SEC will look at them and say, nope. So this is leading to your edge. Do you want to make 20% of your portfolio be one stock? Maybe it's gotten great returns and grew out to be this big naturally in your portfolio without additionally putting money into it. You can do that. Sometimes these people aren't buying the stock because they legally can't buy it. Number four is the size disadvantages. Having a lot of money is actually a big problem with investing. When you have billions of dollars, it limits your choices. Imagine a billion dollar fund buying a micro cap stock. Would that do anything to help them? No, not even a little bit. Even if it had explosive returns, it wouldn't even make a fractional percent difference in their portfolio. Being big means limiting your choices to bigger companies. And less choices equals lower chance to find a valuable purchase. Boss, we're running out of places to put our clients' money. But this leads to your edge. I bet most people reading this have less than $10 million, which includes me. To you, buying those small companies does matter to your portfolio. If the stock goes up 20% in a year, those are serious gains to your overall portfolio, and that would never happen with big money. Yo, man, that stock tripled in value and made me $10,000. This is crazy. The fifth of the disadvantages is when they have money. These people are using other people's money. So imagine a good market. Everyone's money goes up in the market. It makes people want to put money in and money being put in when stocks are expensive. I understand we have a lot of money we need to distribute, but everything is expensive now. Oh well, we need to put this money somewhere. Now imagine a bad market. Stocks are dropping, portfolios are dropping, clients want to pull money out, less money to invest when cheaper. Wow, look at all these opportunities to buy. Wait, why is all the money disappearing? And this leads to your edge over them. You choose when you want to buy and sell. Other people aren't determining when you have the money or not in your portfolio. It's all yours, so you can buy when the market is declining. Yes, I can buy the dip with the extra money I placed in a high-yield online savings account waiting for this moment. Lastly, we have time wasted explaining themselves. Bosses and clients want explanations for their choices. Half of their time is spent typing up why they chose to buy it or sell it. That's time that could have been used researching instead. Sure thing, boss. I'll type up that report for you on why this is a strong buy company. It'll take about five hours, but that's okay, right? That leads to your edge, because you don't have to explain anything to anyone. It's even easier if you just don't say anything about your purchases, which you can do since it's your money. Now we'll get into discovering your edge. What we previously talked about was disadvantages that smart money had which you didn't have, and they were benefits from avoiding negatives. Now we can get into advantages that dumb money has over these institutions. Benefits from obtaining positives. What job does an analyst have? Yeah, analyzing stocks. They have a lot of quantitative data on their side to do this as well. However, it takes quantitative and qualitative data for picking stocks. You have to understand the minds of the people in our business. We all read the same newspapers and magazines and listen to the same economists. We're a very homogenous lot, quite frankly. They aren't seeing major issues until it's reported in their newspapers or magazines, and they likely don't have as much opinion on the product or service like dumb money does. Another example of their street leg. So yeah, turns out the company's plan to push for cheaper parts made margins go up, but all the consumers hate it so much they stopped buying. If we only knew exactly what qualitative features the customers were looking for, this would be much easier. You, however, are very knowledgeable about a certain field. Way more than any analyst could dream of. Ways you have an edge over Wall Street. Number one is your job. 
Number two is your hobbies and passions. And number three, your purchases slash services that you use regularly. Let's go into the first one, your job. What items is your company spending a lot of money on? Items that constantly get rebought are a huge plus. And why did your company choose to buy from them? Was it price? Was it easy to use, convenient, the quality? And what specific knowledge have you gained from your job? What's some things you know that most people don't? How can you apply this knowledge with investing? Let's get into the example of the car mechanic. What cars constantly need repairs? What are people's opinions on their cars? And which brands of products do you buy to repair the cars that come into your shop? Number two is your hobbies and passions. How much do people with your hobbies spend per year? Such as meditation, which is very low money, or gaming, which is higher money. How big of a hobby is this? The number of people also doing this. Is it popular with lots of money there or niche with less of an opportunity? Why do you choose the items you use? Is it the price, quality, convenience, and so on? So for example, we'll go into gaming. What companies are selling the games people buy? What computers and graphics cards are you buying? And how much are people spending in microtransactions inside the games they already purchased? Third is your purchases or services that you use regularly. What's something you can't imagine living without? And why is it so important to you? Why is this company the one you chose over others? Was it the price, quality, convenience, exclusivity, and so on? Do you constantly give that company lots of money? Large monthly payments or one payment that lasts for years? For example, with this, we'll go into Amazon. Why do you keep using Amazon services? What would it take to make you use other online selling platforms? What would make Amazon's shopping experience better? At this point, you might be saying, so I found an amazing product or service. Do I buy it now? Well, that'll be explained in much greater detail in part two of the series. Part one is just going over general advice from Peter Lynch. Then we can get into 50,000 Frenchmen can be wrong. Don't fall victim to everyone's doing it. In the 1970s, it was laziness in buying overpriced blue chips with these people saying, these are big name companies, they can't fail. In the 1990s, leading up to the dot-com crash, it's a new market, the internet changes everything. It's going to be okay. Wait a minute, this doesn't seem like a good idea. And this is what Peter has been hearing lately. Small investors have no chance. And the translation of that is, they want your money in their mutual fund. This will never fail. That would never work. Translation, I'm an idiot. You can trust me, I have a degree. 12 silliest and most dangerous things people say about stock prices. The first of which is, it's gone down so much already, it can't go lower. Well, the truth is, it can go lower. And I'm going to use GameStop as an example. In November 6th, 2015, it was trading for $46.82 a share. And then we have a dip soon after that disaster strikes before the turn of the 2016 year. And people might have been saying, it's gone down so much already, it can't go lower. But then past 2018, it's trading for about $15 a share. And people might be saying again, it's gone down so much already, it can't go lower. And now here we are in late July 2019, and it's trading for $4.01 a share. And I'm betting somebody's going to be saying, it's gone down so much already, it can't go lower. The second of the things they say is, you can tell when the stock hits the bottom. You might be catching the knife before it hits the ground if you're following this phrase. Buying during the sharp declines can lead to big losses. Dropping a lot doesn't mean it can't go lower in the short term. Things are easier to see in hindsight, looking retrospectively on a stock graph and saying, that was the bottom, that's obvious we should have bought then, isn't accurate. Number three is, if it's gone this high, how can it go higher? 
The price moving up fast doesn't mean it'll stop soon. Price is determined by the company's performance and future outlooks. So for example, with Starbucks, we have one year return of 90.96%, not even including the dividends. And right here, somebody might have been saying, if it's gone this high, how can it go higher? And they would have missed out on this point just before June when it started dipping and people are thinking to themselves, if it's gone this high, how can it go higher? And then they would have missed out on the latest earnings report where, once again, it starts shooting up higher because their earnings are very good. So just because it's gone up high doesn't mean that it's going to stop. Number four, it's only $3 a share. What could I lose? And maybe these people should get a pencil and paper because we're going to get into some math. A $100 stock drops 10% missing earnings, in which case you lose 10%. Or the second scenario, a $3 stock drops 10% missing earnings, in which case you lose 10%. Seems pretty similar. Part two math, I buy $3,000 of stock where each one costs $100. Or second scenario, I buy $3,000 of stock where each one costs $3. Regardless of stock price, I still have $3,000 of my money at risk. The price alone is irrelevant. Number five, eventually they always come back and someone needs to explain bankruptcy to these people because they always come back Right, guys? Back to Blockbuster? Number six is, it's always darkest before dawn. And this is for all the optimistic people out there. It's a belief that when things get bad, they get better soon. Sometimes when a company makes a very bad announcement, the price will drop dramatically. Then keep dropping because the announcement was really bad. And keep dropping. And go out of business. Number seven, when it rebounds to $10, I'll sell. Setting arbitrary prices to get out of stocks you don't like anymore doesn't make sense. You might be holding a loser for a long time. I'm sure it will return eventually. I just have to wait a little bit longer. Number eight is conservative stocks don't fluctuate much. There aren't stock choices you can totally ignore forever in your portfolio, even the blue chips and utilities. So for example, I have GE, and recently there's been a lot of drama with this. So it slid down more than 50%, and it caused it to go down to $6.76 a share. Then it rose back recently to about $10 a share. And now it's going sideways. So just because it's a large history with a lot of history or a utility doesn't mean that it's immune to price fluctuations. Number nine, it's taking too long for anything to happen. Companies where earnings keep increasing, but it looks like the stock price doesn't move. This one is the hardest to mentally break because you'll begin to think there's something you're missing, and there possibly could be. I keep running, but I don't move anywhere. Number 10, look at all the money I lost. I didn't buy it. It's easy to look retrospectively and see what you, in quotations, lost. I should have invested in Amazon. I missed out big. This mentality will make you go nowhere and Peter feels like it's a waste of time. You didn't actually lose money. Number 11, I missed that one. I'll catch the next one. And this is similar to the last point, but you should be really careful buying the next something. A company similar to what you missed likely won't perform as well because of the already established competition. So for example, you have the big boss, Microsoft, versus the up-and-coming startup computer software company. So you might want to catch the next startup computer software company, but that means you have to fight against Microsoft, and that's not something that's very easy. And number 12, stock is up equals I'm right, or it's down equals I'm wrong. Typically, these are people looking in the short term. It's still just a bidding war in the short term, Going up or down right after you bought it doesn't mean much. Up 1% today. Nice job. Still up 5% from last month. I must have a gift. Now we can get into the mirror test. Step one is to find a mirror. Unless you're a Disney princess, then find a pool of water. Step two, ask yourself, do I need the money? If yes, Peter recommends saving in a savings account. Things you might need liquid cash for is one, an emergency fund for you and your family. Number two, saving for a house, we'll get into that. And three, saving for college, if you choose to go. Then you can ask yourself, do I own a house? 
Reasons he likes people saving for houses is one, it's low interest leverage, two, the tax advantages, three, people don't panic sell their houses. And I understand some people need or want to rent due to not being able to settle in one place. This is Peter's take on saving for a down payment in the future when you eventually get there. I think we need to sell the house. I saw the house prices in the area are dropping by 10%. Sell everything before it's too late. What is he going on about? Nobody does that. Step four is to ask yourself, do I have the personal qualities that will bring me success in the stocks? Some qualities include, but are not limited to, patience, self-reliance, common sense, pain tolerance, humility, persistence, and ability to ignore public panic. Well, what about options, futures, and shorts? Well, this is Peter's experience with them. I've never bought a future nor an option in my entire investing career, and I can't imagine buying one now. Wow, Peter. Can't teach an old dog new tricks? Well, he has a really low opinion of this stuff, so let's just get into that. He says, if this was sensible investing, then the Titanic was a tight ship. So options trading, according to Peter Lynch, is equivalent to the Titanic. So why does he not care? It requires a lot of time to explain and understand everything. He's made so much money from buying and holding, just why bother? So up here is the idea you'll make big returns on your money by learning about options, futures, and shorts. And then there's the equal opportunity to make big losses and how much time it takes to learn all this stuff and constantly be worrying about your investments. So do you like Peter Lynch? If you like his style of investing, then get his books from the description down below. Those are the books that I read to make this video. His books will give diagrams and charts to help you learn, and his writing is very humorous and easy to read. And did you learn something new or think about investing in a new way? Then smash the like button to show you enjoy these videos. And subscribe and hit the bell if you're new here. These types of videos take a long time to make, so it's greatly appreciated. Thanks for watching.